You guys doing all right this morning? Amen. Grab your Bibles. We're going to jump right into the Word. And we're going to pick up where we left up on last week to enable God to just move in our midst and then just to be God uh, in our midst this morning. So here's what I want you to do. Do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the reason we're doing this is that we want to stay ready so we don't have to get ready. Yeah, amen. Y'all remember the days when, when you were fighting in school? Some of y'all was good, were good students. I used to fight, amen, yeah. Then the Lord kind of touched me. But you know how it is with fighting, right? Somebody, when you, when you start to argue, we make all this noise. You want to hit me? You want to get this? And we spend all that time putting our dukes up and all that stuff, trying to get ready to get our minds in the framework. I'm about to fight, right? And you spend so much time trying to get ready that if the person's already ready, they just suck a punch you and hit you one good one while you're doing all that stuff, right? Because they were already ready, right? And, and a lot of us don't realize that that's what happens with us in the spiritual realm with the enemy. Is that while we go going through all this antics, he done punched us and hit us because he was always ready. So the intent is for us to stay ready. We'll talk a little bit about that this morning as opposed to spending too much time trying to get ready, right? Amen. So if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to download our podcast um, or go to iTunes or go to uh, our website and grab the message from last week to bring you up to speed so you can um, be caught up with us because we're going to jump on part two. And just what I'm doing this morning is just finishing up the remain of the message from last week. So uh, let me pray. Then we're going to read the scripture. Then we'll talk. I'll review a little bit. And then we'll pick up where we left off to enable God to move and have his way. So bow your heads with me. Let's just pray. Holy Spirit, we need you. We pray for a fresh anointing. I say this every Sunday. Um, we're not praying for this morning's anointing. This morning was a different audience, God, but we have a different audience today, so we want you to speak afresh. We want you to anoint us afresh, God, so we can hear from you, we can be pure, and we can prepare our hearts to be who you would have us to be. So Holy Spirit, guide. Holy Spirit, lead. Holy Spirit, direct. And as I go into your word, I lay flesh aside and invite you to fill me afresh with your spirit, a fresh word, a fresh anointing, God, so you can be who you would have us to be. We love you. It is in Jesus' name, and all God's children say together, amen. Grab your Bibles and go to um, Daniel chapter 1. Let me read the first seven verses, um, because last week we made it through, I think it was verse 8. And then I'll pick up in verse 8, and we will dig deeper uh, into the text to allow God to move and have his way. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 and just review briefly. And verses 1 through 7 says it this way, In the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the, line of, to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Asphenaz, his chief eunuch, eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding and learning, and competent to stand in the king's place and to teach them, watch this, the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And then the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. Now, here's what we shared with you last week, just by way of a little bit of context before we jumped into the text. I need to remind you, as we did on this past Wednesday, that this world is not our home. We need to be cognizant of that. Come on, say amen if you believe that. I, I use the term resident aliens, right? Where resident aliens were just strangers passing through. Heaven really is our home. 
And what has happened is we've given our heart to God. God came and redeemed us from this sinful place. We've given our lives to him. But we're left to live here. And because we're left to live here, here's what the enemy does. His goal is to culturally assimilate us to make us forget the fact that heaven is our home. And if we can forget the truth that heaven is our home, we start to look like we're citizens of this world. Come on. We behave that way. We talk that way. We conduct ourselves that way. May I say we eat that way. We drink that way. You kind of get what I'm saying? We become culturally assimilated. And the caution that we exercised last week was, was to be careful, be cognizant of the fact that that's the enemy's goal, and we ought to be care careful of being completely culturally assimilated into the culture. And that's what was going on in the text as we saw last week, that the children of Israel were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar the king, and his goal was to completely convert them and cause them to forget the truth that their kingdom subjects and that their kingdom belong, that their children belong to God. So here's some of the things that, that we said, first of all, when we talked about not eating from the king's table, is that we've got to avoid complete cultural assimilation. We must be cognizant of that. And we must be careful of that because when you look at the text, there were these four simple things that the king did as a way of assimilating those people to, to remove their identity and to cause them to become subjects of his kingdom. So there was an attack on the future leaders. And if you were to, to keep your ear to the ground on what's going on in the metro Denver, but let me say as far as our country today is that there seems to be an attack on young people, right? I mean, come on, talk to me. And, and what it is, those are really our future leaders. And if the enemy can kill them at their youth and prevent them from growing to become the people that God has called us to do, he has an impact on the future. And when you look at what's going on in the text, it is no different from what Nebuchadnezzar is doing with the people that he takes uh, captive. There's an attack on the youth. So he gets the youth. And then notice what he does. He changes their language. He teaches them the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. They have to change the, the, what they knew it, as it relates to their knowledge, as it relates to the way they spoke. He went about doing that. And then he changed their diet. He changed the things that they were called to eat by God. And then more importantly, he decides to change their name, which has everything to do with the authority that was over them and the identity that they were given from their childhood. And I want to point that out because I need us to know that if we're going to be who God would have us to be, the enemy does the same thing to us. Very, very important that we understand that. And when you look at popular culture, popular culture is doing the same thing to our children. And might I be even brave enough to say they're doing the same thing to you and I if we're not cognizant of that, right? So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, avoid cultural assimilation. Here's what you find in the text. And I want to point this out. And I'm just, I'm going to come down because I want to I want to talk to you all this morning. I just want to share from my heart. Here's, here's what you find in the text that I want us to be careful is that when you look at the text, in spite of all the people that were captive, this is where Daniel comes in because Daniel made a decision that made him different and that caused him to stand out from amongst his peers, right? And so when you look at this, look at what, look at what verse 8 says, okay? And as we talked about, to beware of the food that's from the king table, verse 8 says it this way. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Daniel, the text says, resolved that he would not defile himself with the food from the king's table, and then he asked the kings, the chief of the eunuch, to help him not to defile himself. So now, we talked about this whole issue of beware of the food from the king's table. So I want to review just briefly. Repeat out of me. Say, self, I must make the decision not to defile myself. Now, you can bear with me a little bit. Let me belabor that point as we step into what we're going to talk about because this is one of the most prevalent 
or predominant lies of the enemy. And one of the most subtle ways that he get us, he gets us to look like the world, even though we're not of the world, right? Is that if he can get you to defile yourself, if he can get you, and well, let me put myself in the equation, if he can get us to defile ourselves, we risk messing up. So here's what this looks like, right? Here's what that word defile meant that we talked about last week. It, it, it meant to, to not desecrate, to, to, to not taint, to not cause um, things that are on the outside that shouldn't be on the inside to enter me and to cause me to begin the process of change. So when, I, when Daniel, the text says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself, Daniel was making a conscious and cognizant decision that it didn't matter what the king offered, I'm not going to allow it to get in me. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, let me help you with that. Let me help you with that. Here's what I said that was nuanced grammatically in that verbal phrase when he said, I made the decision not to defile myself. Here, here, here's what the imperfective sense says in the, in the Hebrew grammar, that when I say to you, Daniel decided, I'm not going to defile myself, don't make the mistake of thinking that when the king said, you're going to eat food from my table, and he offered them food, that in that instant, Daniel was presented with a choice for the first time. Okay? And that what he did, the decision he made, was the first time he made that decision. I need to point that out, especially as we talk about going into this 21 days of fasting. Here's what I said with you last week. Assume over here is Judah. So here is Daniel in his, in his land of Judah. And a lot of you have been asking me what was so unique about Daniel that caused him to make that stand. So here's what I want you to understand. The text says he was a youth, young man. So whatever his upbringing was, he had resolved in his life as a child while he was still in Judah, that God is my God, I'm going to serve God, for God I live and for God I die. Come on, are you with me? This was made in his childhood, and it was part of his upbringing that he was going to serve God. So lock into this. So when Jehoiakim came, I mean, when Nebuchadnezzar came and he overthrew Jehoiakim's empire and then they brought him into captivity in the land of Babylon and Daniel was faced now with food from the king's table. Here's the decision Daniel had to make. I've been doing this all along. So what you're offering me is not going to cause me to change who I am. Oh, I hope you... Let, let me help you. Let me help you. I stayed ready. So now that you're trying to tempt me, I don't have to get ready. Is this making sense? You see, my problem and your problem is this. Because I don't stay ready, oh, come on now. Whenever I'm tempted, I got to spend time Getting ready, right? So, so here's how I painted it in my illustration. Hey, man, you want to fight? Okay, give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'm going through all that stuff, and while I'm doing that, the enemy is already punt. Come on, talk to me. Y'all know what? Because we hadn't stayed ready, and the reason we fail is because we get hit before we can put our arms up. I hope this is making sense to you. So when, Dan, when Daniel found himself in that situation where he was presented with choice, where he was presented with partaking from food from the king's table, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, the four of those guys, here's what they said. We resolve not to partake with food from the king's table because, listen to this carefully, it's not going to change who we are. They understood that they were resident aliens in Babylonian captivity or a Chaldean empire. They knew they were residents of God's kingdom. And regardless of where they found themselves, they were not going to allow the present kingdom to get in them to change them. Oh, come on, talk to me, y'all. Isn't that the struggle? Come on, isn't that, isn't that the temptation? Isn't that the struggle that you and I face today as believers in Christ? 
Well, maybe, the, maybe your problem is this. Maybe you, you think that eating food from the king's table is literal food. And maybe you don't understand the metaphor. Let me, let me help you with this. If Daniel were present today and he was taken captive today, here is what food from the king's table would look like. Daniel would say, you know what? I'm not going to look at certain things on Facebook. Maybe now I'm getting closer to home. Come on, y'all. You know what? I'm not going to click that link with that beautiful lady on it. Maybe I'm getting closer to home now, right? You know what? I'm not, I'm not going to go to certain places. Come on, talk to me. I'm not going to partake of certain things. I'm not going to look at certain situations on YouTube with certain number of X's on it. Maybe, maybe I'm not talking to y'all, but I'm talking to somebody at the church down the road there. Come on. People with real struggles. People that go through real difficulties in life. People with real temptations. Here's Daniel. I'm not going to do it. And here's the beauty of what I'm trying to communicate with you. He made the decision early in life such that when it tempted him while in captivity, he could stand firm. And my problem is, I didn't make the decision early in life. And so when the temptation come, it's a wrestle. Come on now. It's a struggle. Come on. Should I or shouldn't I? And I move on to the next page in, on Facebook, but in the back of my mind, there's a page where I came from. Come on, talk to me this morning. And I want to go back and look, but I'm wrestling. Should I? Shouldn't I? But if you make the decision as a child and you stayed ready, oh, I wish I had. I wish I had folk that would be honest with me this morning. Am I just talking to myself? We can stand better. Are you with me? If we make the decision early in life. And the reason I want to emphasize this point because Daniel made a decision. He resolved that I would not defile myself with the food from the king's table. So whatever the world threw at him, he was able to withstand and to make it. Let me say it this way. He was in Babylon but Babylon didn't get in him. Amen. Illustration I gave this morning, Jesus was in the world, and Jesus was not of the world. So here's what it would look like in the world. He would get invited to secular parties, and he would go to the secular parties. Matter of fact, when they ran out of liquor, he'd hook them up. Y'all wasn't ready for that, were you? Y'all wasn't ready for that, amen. Y'all wasn't ready for that, because y'all too saved, Amen. When, when, when they would have funeral processions, he would go to secular funerals and he would raise their dead. Come on now. He, he would see their sick and he would heal their sick. He would get invited to dinner with scribes and Pharisees. These weren't elders and, and leaders in today's church. These were people that were opposing to him. He would get invited to dinners with them. He would go sit with them. And here's what the church people would say. Man, he's just hanging out with sinners and publicans. And here's what he would say. I came for the sick, not for the well, and to bring sinners to repentance. So here's what that means. He knew who he was and he made a decision while he was still in heaven that when he came to earth, come on, and he stayed ready so he wouldn't have to get ready so he can go in the world but not allow the world to get in him. And we've got to understand that concept. And how do we let the world get in us? By eating from the king's table. You get it. You get it. We, and, and here's why I want to say this. It is such a subtle ploy of the enemy. That here's what it sounds like. Let me, let me give you this story, and then it's going to make sense, sense in a little while. Eve looked at the fruit, and it was good and pleasing to the eye. So she took it and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, because she saw nothing wrong with it. King's table stuff. And it's the same thing with us. Amen. Right? Ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong with this. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And, and here's the thing. She could look at it all day long because it was there for her to look at. The problem was when she let it get in her. Right? I'm in the world. I will see. I will encounter. But my challenge is stay ready such that it doesn't get in me. Oh, come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't let it get in you. 
Come on, say it again. Say, don't let it get in you. Because here's what happens. I said this last week. And listen to last week's message if you miss it. When it gets in you, you start sounding like it. When it gets in you, you start looking like it. Come on. When it gets in you, you start dressing like it. Come on, talk to me this morning. When it gets in you, and here's what, here's what happens. We look no different than the world. We sound no different than the world. And then when we tell them we're really Christians, here's how they call us. You're, you're hypocritic. Y'all know that word? Where we should be in it, but not of it. So Daniel resolved. That I'm not going to defile myself. Come on, make the say. I, I'm going to resolve not to defile myself. Okay, and 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 let me let me say this quick thing real quick because I know some of y'all are struggling as we talk about going into this 21 day of fast and 24 hour prayer, and you're kind of like, man, I don't know if I can do that, man. I don't know if I can make it. I'm not that spiritual. I don't know all that stuff. I want you to hear me say, just like Daniel said, that God has already given you favor. Okay, let me let me say it differently. You can do it. Okay, look at the text. Look at the text real quick. Look with me at at verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. And he says, why should he see that you were worse off, were in worse off condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Um, Verse 9 said, but God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the eunuch. And the king, now now this is striking to me because I want to press this out. I want to press this, right? The eunuch was afraid of the king that he served. Daniel was faithful to the God that he served. Say it again, say it again, say it again, say it again. The eunuch was afraid of the king that he served. Daniel was faithful to the God that he served. Right? A very, very important principle and concept that we need not miss is that it doesn't matter where we find ourselves. If we understand whose we are and who we serve, I want you to hear me say to you this morning that God has given you favor to say no, to withstand, and to be faithful to him regardless of what the opposition, regardless of what the temptation may be. You can do it because, let me put it this way, greater is he that is where? In you than he that is where? Yeah, so so while the king is afraid of an earthly ruler, Daniel knows who's in him and who he serves. So his commitment was to God and he knew that God could touch the king that this ruler was afraid of. So hear me people, as we're about to go through this process, don't let the enemy plant seeds of doubt and tell you what you can and can't do. I want you all to hear me say that. This is equivalent to people saying to you, oh, you'll never change because you've been that way all your life. If God went to Calvary so you can change. Oh, my gosh, I wish I had a praying church this morning. Are you hearing me? Don't let nobody say, the king's got you. You'll never change. You just need to make the decision, this is what I'm going to do. Right? You just need to make that decision, and we will be amazed at what, what, what happens. So here's the thing. God has already shown him favor, and let me go to this next thing. And because God has already showed Daniel favor, here's what we need to learn to do. We need to just try God. Yeah. You just need to try him. Right? Look, 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 look at this. Look at the text. Jump down. Jump down to verse, verse 11. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days and let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then he says, then let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat the king's food be observed by you. And I love this phrase, and deal with your servant according to what you see. Let me read that one more time, one more time, one more time. Test your servants for how many days? And then he says, let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
And then let our parents and the appearance of the youth who eat the king's food be observed by you. And then, I love this, and treat us based on what you see. Read that one more time so that might say something to somebody. Test us for 10 days, he said. And so only give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then at the end of that, look at us and look at the other youth who keep eating from the, ting, the king's table and then treat us based on what you see. Now, people, that's a bold statement. That's, 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 come on, y'all. That's a bold statement. You know, I, I said it this way this morning. It's almost as if there, I mean, Daniel has a sense of spiritual arrogance about himself because of his confidence in God, right? He knew God so much that, check this out, as long as I stay faithful to God, right? As long as I stay committed to God, it's almost as if Daniel is saying, put me up against the best you got. Oh, come on, y'all. That's a level of confidence in the ability of God. So he says, put us through this test for 10 year, 10 days, and I'm telling you what God's going to do. So I want to press that out. I want to press that just a little bit because I need for us to know as a church that if God asks you to do something, if God calls us to trust him, if God calls us to be faithful to him, if God calls us to be committed to him, if he wants to remind us that we're in the world, but don't be assimilated completely into the world, that you need to hear me say this morning that God's got you. Oh, come on. You got to know that this morning. That God's got you. That, that if God says stay faithful and he says, trust me, nobody in the world can stand up to you because of who God is. And understand this with me. Understand Daniel's history. I'm going to say it again. He didn't just start because he found himself in the predicament. Maybe that's not helping you. When David was about to fight Goliath, that wasn't his first fight. You see, if this is your first fight, you might be a little nervous about it. But I tell you what, just don't make it your last fight. And then the next one, you'll be all ready to go. So here's David locked into this. As a child... He fought a bear. Come on now. And then he continued to grow and he fought a lion. I want y'all to hear me. And so while he was still a child, he met a Goliath. And what you need to know about his encounter with Goliath, he wasn't trying to get ready. He was already yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying. So he stayed ready. So when he encountered Goliath, watch Saul. Amen. You need to take my tunic. You need to take my sword. You need to take my shit. Yo, bro, I'm already ready. I wish I had somebody in here. And, and if we can stay ready. And so here's Daniel's statement. Test me. God has already proven himself faithful so I don't have to get ready for nothing. I've already stayed ready, listen to this, because it's been the pattern of my lifestyle. I lived that way. I stay ready. So I don't have to get ready. Because we spend too much time taking off earrings and taking off glasses and taking off hair, amen, and taking off all, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all, amen, I need to stay serious, amen, <laughs> we, we spend too much time doing that, that we get hit every single time, and so we go to work, and the boss says, we're going to announce layoffs, and you go into this panic because you hadn't been ready yet, and you come to church. Oh my gosh, they're going to lay people off. Can y'all pray with me? You should have been already prayed up before you went to work. Come on, talk to me. Here's how I said it last week. The person cuts you off in the street, and we start to speak Babylonian to the people as opposed to speaking the Word of God because we weren't already ready. Come on, talk to me. You're at home, and then your wife or your husband get in an argument with you, and all this Babylonian stuff start coming out. Babylon Behaviors. Why? Because you didn't stay ready. Come on. And then at the end, you're trying to get ready afterwards. It's too late. Too late. That's why we mess up. 
And every time the enemy gets us is because we let our guards down. Amen. Ephesians put it this way in Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God. So when the day of evil come, you may be able to what? I want you to hear how that's saying. I'm going to say it again. I want you to hear the grammatical tenses and the verbal tenses that I'm using. Put on the whole armor of God so in the future, when the day of evil comes, you won't have to get ready. You would have already been ready. You stay ready. Does this make sense? You stay ready. Let me put it. Here's a term you would know. We stay prayed up. Yeah. We stay in the presence of God, right? I mean, we do it. Here's how Paul says it in Romans 8. We walk in the Spirit so we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. My problem is when I encounter hardship, when I encounter difficulty, I spend too much time trying to prepare for the fight when I should be fighting. And I wonder why I lose so much. You kind of get it? You kind of get it, right? And it's difficult. So here's what I'm going to say. Put God to the test. And then the, the last thing that, that, that I want to say to you before I move on to the next point. Don't, don't, don't put God to the test or put yourself to the test and then fail your own test. I, I'm, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say don't, 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 don't set the test up, y'all. And then fail your own test. I know somebody in here saying, not me, preacher. Uh, well, the gym that has your membership. <laughs> Beginning of the year, I'm going to be buff. I'm going to do this. I'm going to lose weight. We set the test up. And then a week later. <laughs> here's Daniel. As a child, he set the test up. And listen to how I'm going to say this. Walking in victory in the test became his lifestyle. Okay, I'm going to say it again. It's not something he started and stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped. It was who he became. So it's easy for him to say to Nebuchadnezzar, I resolve not to defile myself because what you see is not what I'm trying to be. It's who I have become. Is this making sense to you all, right? So as we talk about going through this process and we use the word consecration, we're talking about becoming something different. I want you to hear me say this. We're coming, talking about, let, let me just connect it to Restoration Christian Fellowship, becoming a different church. So here's what we say. We want to be a house of prayer, but we're not talking about something we want to start and then stop and start and then stop and then start and then stop. Come on, I want y'all to hear me. We, we want to say, I want you to hear me say a lifestyle change. We want you to hear me say behavioral changes. We want you to hear me say something completely different in our lives such that when the test comes, we don't have to get ready. We've already been ready. Use myself as an illustration this morning. I was sharing with first service that, that um, I'm 12 years surviving cancer now, and um, I, I still go for my annual checkups. And every time I go, my oncologist says to me, why are you here, Felix? And, and I, I kind of summarize by saying, you know, I want to make, make God famous, right? Because here's the thing. This is the thing. They, every time I go, they do their stuff, but they never see anything, which is fine. Which, and I love that. I love that, right? So you go in there, and you know how it is, right? You, you go in the hospital, they put you on the scale, and you kind of don't look down because you don't want to, you know, you paid for that gym membership. Yeah, I told you I remember, right? And you don't want to look bad. Then they take your blood pressure, and they run all these tests on you, and then they say, there's nothing wrong. Why are you here? I say, because I want to make God famous. Check this out. Check this out, check this out, because I've resolved in myself not to go back. So here's what that means for me as a cancer survivor, right? I went through this episode where I found out what was wrong, and I realized that if I keep starting and stopping and starting and stopping, I position myself for this disease to resurface. So I have to retrain my body with the right nutrients to prevent. You get it? I want you to hear me say it very, very, very carefully. So here's what that means. At the time that I made that decision 12 years ago, I got to walk differently. 
So when Nebuchadnezzar presents food from the king's table, I got to say, I resolve not to. Y'all know it. Defile myself. With the, it's not a decision I make in the moment. I made the decision back then. I made it back then. So it's a lifestyle change. You kind of get where I'm going? So here, I want you all to hear me say this carefully. So what I am saying to you as we go through this period of fasting and we go through a period of praying, you have to figure out what is it that you need to change. <laughs> See, a lot of y'all thought it was just, I'm just going to stop eating meat for about 21 days, and then you're going to go back. <laughs> this is why I'm saying it's not about food. It's not about vegetables, Right? That might be the means to the end. So I might sacrifice eating steak or eating fish or eating whatever and just do vegetable for a season. But the reason I'm doing that is not for the fish and the vegetables or the food. I'm doing it because there's something in me. I wish I had somebody in here that I need to change to make it a new lifestyle. I'm changing my lifestyle. So the next time I come up to this menu and this smorgasbord from the king's table, I could say I've resolved not to defile myself with that. And then when I find out what the next thing is, I do it all over again. So after a while, by and by, you can offer me whatever you want. It stops at the eyes. It never enters. I hope I'm helping somebody. I'm hoping this is making sense to you, right? So, so this is how I've been saying it all day. I stay ready so I don't have to get ready. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better learn how to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. So say this, when you start, don't fail your own test. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't fail. Here, here's, here's the last thing I want to share real quick, right? Right? So, so stay ready so you don't have to get ready. So look at the text. Look, look at the text. Look at, look at how this fleshes itself out in Daniel's life. So look with me at verse 17. Verse 17 says it this way. And for these four youth, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time when the king had commend, com commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them, how many times? Ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of Cyrus the king. Here's, here's what that's saying. It's saying these couple of things that we're talking about. God gave them wisdom and understanding. So there's benefits to consecration. There's benefits to fasting. There's benefits to, to, to stopping certain things to change our lifestyle. He blessed them with wisdom and understanding. They, they, they were fulfilling their destiny. I mean, I, I like the last one, right? He promoted them to high places in the enemy's camp. It doesn't get better than that. Here you are, a Christian in a secular corporate environment and you the most righteous thing there you've got the highest seat oh y'all not hearing me this is what the benefits are right what God does how God worked in them how God promoted them why because they refuse to compromise on their standards by not eating from the king's table and the only reason they were able to do that is they stayed ready so they don't have to get ready they stayed committed and God proved himself faithful. Now, I know somebody is saying, all right, Pastor Felix, why do I need to do this, right? Why should I put my name on that board out there and set this test up and say, I'm going to pray with you all one hour in this 21 days, and maybe you might want to pray more, but I'm going to consecrate myself and fast for 21 days and pray with this church and pray for myself and my family and believe God for the miraculous. Let me tell you why you want to do this. Because number one, when you do that, you are postured to accurately hear the voice of God. 
Let me help you say it again. You are positioned, and listen to the word I'm using, to accurately hear the word of God. What do you mean by that, preacher? Here's the deal. When I consecrate myself and I start to push away from the king's table, guess what I'm doing? I am reducing the noises in my head. I wish I had somebody. I, I, come on, y'all. Come on, come on. Listen, listen, listen. I know I'm not talking to myself when, I'm, when I made this statement. You know how it is when you go on your knees to pray and you say, I'm going to pray for five minutes. And the moment you open your head, your mind is filled with a whole lot of conversations. Come on. And, and you can't even pray for two minutes before something else over here start talking to you about that. And something else. Talk, and you forgot the fact that you were there to talk to God. It's the amount of voices. And why are there so many voices in our head? It's because of the amount of places that we eat from the king's table. And the moment we commit to God, everything starts to speak at the same time. And here's, here's, God, is that you? I guess that wasn't God. Oh, that was the movie I saw. Okay. (laughs) God, is that you? You get it? And we can't hear him clearly because of the distractions. Okay? The reason I want to point this out, here's what happened in Daniel chapter 2. And I want you all to read this when you get home. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And the dream was so fierce that it literally scared him half to death. He couldn't sleep. He lost sleep. He had all kinds of stuff going on. And so here's what he does. He calls all his magicians, all his enchanters, all his sorcerers. He calls his whole, the whole magical realm of his kingdom together. And here's what he said to them. He said, hey, I want you all to tell me my dream. And I want you all to tell me the interpretation of my dream. Right? And, and they're like, you want us to do what? And, and, and he said, tell me my dream and then interpret the dream that you're going to tell me that I had. And they're like, hold up, Neb, hold up, Neb. You mean you're going to tell us the dream and then we're going to interpret what you tell us? He says, no, 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 no. If I did that, you can tell me anything. And here's the, the sorcerer's response. Daniel, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, nobody can do that. Only the gods could do that. And here's what this says. And those gods don't reside within humans. And here's Neb's response. All y'all a bunch of phonies. So y'all just been faking it all the time that you don't have access to the gods like that? And he sent this edict. I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to kill all the enchanters. I'm going to kill all the magicians. I'm going to kill all the wise people in my kingdom. So he sent his his eunuchs out to kill them. And then when they got to Daniel, they said to him, Hey, Daniel, we're here to kill you. And here's Daniel. Why are you here to kill me? Because the king had a dream and nobody can tell him what he dreamt, especially the interpretation of the dream. And here's Daniel. Well, I've been ready. Oh, you got to read that story. I got to read that story. I don't have to get ready. I've been ready. And here's how the story goes. Because I've been positioned to always hear from God. And if God is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, the same God that spoke to him is the same God that's going to speak to me. And I haven't eaten from the table, so my mind is clear. I wish I had somebody. He goes to Nebs and he tells him what he dreamt. And then he tells him the interpretation of the dream. Here's Nebuchadnezzar. Dang, Daniel, you the man. Here's Daniel. No, Nebuchadnezzar, God is God. You kind of get what I'm saying? And when you stay ready, you allow God to have preeminence or preeminence in your life. So here's my deal. When I consecrate myself, when I fast, when I set time aside, I declutter. I declutter so God can speak. I declutter so God can speak. If you've been wrestling with hearing God, try decluttering. Come on, say amen. Here's the second thing. I'm almost done. I got one more after this. Second thing real quick, okay? Here's the thing. Is that you have the assurance that God's going to be with you through the fire. Right? Y'all know the three Hebrew boys, right? I'm not talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? I'm talking about Ananiah, Azariah, Mishael. Y'all know them through those names now, right? The king issued this edict that he's going to build. He built this great image. And then here's what he said to them, at, to the, his kingdom. At the sound of the music, I need everybody in my empire to bow down and worship me. 
Here's Ananiah, Hezariah, and Mishael once again. They hear this, and they don't freak out because they had already stayed ready. They just continued their lifestyle. Very important, right? Because it's who they were, not what they were trying to do in the moment. King sees them. Y'all know the story, right? He, he gobbles them up, and he says, if you're not going to bow before me, i got to throw you in the fiery furnace. And what's striking about the story that a lot of us missed is that their prayer life did not prevent them from being thrown in the fire. See, here's what we do, right? We start now so we can avoid the fire. Y'all didn't want to hear that. Y'all didn't want to hear that. Y'all didn't want to hear that. Y'all didn't want to hear that because you didn't want to lose a job. You didn't want to hear that because you didn't want him to leave. You didn't want to hear that because you didn't want her to leave. You didn't want to hear that because you didn't want to lose the house. Come on, talk to me. So we pray to God for, not because he is. And here's the truth of what consecration does. Even though they were thrown in the fire, God showed up with them in, and he was with them through. You kind of get it? So here's what consecration does. When the storms of life comes, you're not worried about it. You don't have to get ready because you've stayed ready. But you have the guarantee, the way David puts it, Yea, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before the presence of my enemies. So guess what? In the midst of whatever the storm is, I can remain who I am because I know where God is. And I can make it through. I can make it through, right? Here's the third and final thing that we're going to pray. Here's the third and final thing. Is that we have the assurance that God will deliver us from the hands of the enemy. This is important. This is important. Here's what was happening with Daniel. And I think it was Daniel chapter 6. Daniel, here's how I'm going to listen to this, had a prayer life where he played, prayed three times a day. Listen to what I'm saying. He stayed ready so he didn't have to. Y'all get it. Three times a day. His haters. Y'all know haters? No people that don't want to see you succeed. Come on, y'all. People that don't want you to see, to see you get that seat. People, come on, y'all, come on, y'all know what I mean. Some of y'all don't have haters. Y'all just make haters up because you just want to talk about haters. Y'all know nothing about it. Right? But so, some of us do. Come on, y'all, haters that, that they, they don't want to see you. They don't want to see you excel. They don't want to see you rise to the top. They don't want to see you get better. So here's what his haters did. They go to the king and they say, king, you need to issue a new law that, that everybody who prays within this empire ought to pray to you. They ought not pray to they, God. They ought to worship you. They ought to bow down to you and they ought to pray to you. And the king was like, yeah. Yeah, you're right. And he issues this new edict and this new law. And then Daniel's haters knew what Daniel was going to do. Let me borrow this again. And they go to Daniel with their cell phone while he was in the window. You got him? I got him. You got him. And they're filming. And they're filming Daniel. And then they go to the king. See, king, we got him. You know who this is? Didn't you just issue a law? Look at what he's doing. Heck, we posted this. It's got a thousand likes. Look at that. We got him. <laughs> and the king looks at Daniel and he takes Daniel. Bro, I love you, man, but you got to worship me. Y'all know the story. And he throws him in the, the lion's den. And then the next day he goes in the lion's den and he says, hey, Daniel, you down there? And Daniel says, what you expect? I've been ready. I didn't have to get ready. Come on. Because the same God I serve is the God that created the lions. Come on. The same God that I serve is the God that can shut up the mouths of these lions. The same God that I serve is the God that can deliver me from the hands of my haters and from the hands of my enemies. And you and I spend too much time preparing for what we should have already been prepared for. And we carry unnecessary worry. Here's how Matthew 6 says it. Why worry about tomorrow what you shall eat or drink? Look at the lilies. They never toil. Look at the birds. They never, you kind of get what I'm saying? 
If your heavenly father cares for them, don't you think he will care more for you? Well, God, why do you take care of the birds like that? Because they stay ready so they don't have to get ready. Is this making sense? The reason we're doing this as a church is so we can always be ready. Anticipation for the miraculous. Anticipation for the favor of God. Anticipation for the hand of God. Come on. Anticipation for that Acts 2 encounter that when people are sick and they come here, we ought to expect that they can be healed. Come on. When people come here with issues and, 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 and fra frailties and all kinds of ailments, we do expect that God can do the miraculous. In our worship experience, we encounter God. We know God is here. The spiritual fervor and tenor of this place changes because we have a spirit of expectation because we stay ready for the move of God. And the fire is lit and the fire is burning. The challenge, join us. Join us. Don't leave here without going there and say, man, let me put God to the test and watch what God's going to do. Right. My life in the past has been when the crisis comes, that's when I prayed the most. I think if I scan the room, I'm comfortable in saying, the majority of you in here, that's your story as well. When the crisis comes, we cry out to God, Lord, help. Imagine if we can smile through the crisis because our pattern is three times a day we face Jerusalem and we pray. We seek God, right? Here's how our Chronicles said it. If my people who are called by my name shall what? Humble themselves, seek my face, pray, turn from their wicked ways. You see the lifestyle change? Turn from their wicked ways. You see the lifestyle change? Turn from their wicked ways. What's going to happen? I will hear from heaven. I will do what? Forgive their sins and I will what? <sighs> I'm talking about a lifestyle change. I'm praying that God would say the same to you. Bow your heads with me. Pastor Katani, come on. Bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we adore you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing and how you've been in our lives. We bless your holy name, God, your worship, your, your awesome God, your wonderful God. And as your word has gone forth this morning, we, we know it's a little lengthy and it's been a little long, so gracious in, grace us in that. But we need to know what it means to stay ready so we don't have to get ready. We love you this morning, God. We magnify your name. We give you praise because of who you are. So teach us as a church how to know you more, how to hear from you more, how to declutter so you can speak clearly to us. Teach us like Daniel not to defile ourselves with the food from the king's table. Let it be a lifestyle change so we can be different, so we can be better, so we can look more like you in this world. That's our goal. We love you this morning, God. We give ourselves to you that you get the glory. With your head bowed, just take a moment. You just take a moment and go to God and ask God to speak to you. Ask God to mold you. Ask God to change you. Ask God to transform you. Ask God to do something different in your life. I know the hour's late, but be patient with us for a little while as we share. This is serious what we're about to do here as a church, and we want you to take it as serious as we're taking it. We want to be different. Lord, I look to you. Lord, I look to you.